Inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. Brian, you were with us on the podcast a couple of years ago, and you talked about how you had just bought your very first rental, and you said you wanted to buy more. It's been two years. I wanted to follow up with you. Did you get stuck, or were you able to buy more rentals? No, Dan. As a matter of fact, since the last time we talked, I've been able to acquire seven more buildings. So now I have a total of eight rental units or eight rental buildings. That's so awesome. I love it. Well, on the show today, we're going to figure out how Brian went from that very first rental to eight buildings and how much money he's making now off of his portfolio. Let's take a real quick break. We'll come right back and we'll catch up with Brian Heron. The first step in buying a rental property is to get pre-qualified. And I would suggest you work with a lender that specializes in working with investors because the last thing you want to have happen is to get to closing and find out the money's not there and you can't close. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender and she'll pre-qualify you for free if you mention Rental Income Podcast. Find out more today. Contact Chaley at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com. NMLS 42056. So to buy seven buildings in two years, that, that's a lot of down payments. How were you coming up with all the money? So um, as I mentioned the previous podcast, I was saving roughly eighteen, nineteen hundred dollars per month. That's out of my paycheck plus the rent I was previously paying and the profits I was earning off of my first rental. Then I also did take a line of credit against my personal home, which is a HELOC um, home equity line of credit, and um, that mixed with being very resourceful and finding deals was really huge in helping me to acquire these properties. So. These all these properties were required through either friends, third party. Uh, I picked up one from a tax sale. I found the three that I purchased com, um, right after the first one off of Craigslist. Um, so out of all these buildings that I've purchased since the beginning, only one was actually found on the MLS. So what have you been buying? What are the properties like? Um, I still stick to smaller rentals. Uh, I would, you know, I was purchasing besides that triplex. I was purchasing duplexes. Up until recently, I've, I've now I've acquired a couple single family homes and I kind of converted over that way. One was just, it was a tax lien and I bought it for taxes and I went and looked at the building, it had a brand new roof. You could tell by, because the under, uh, the soffits and everything were still shiny and then it had brand new windows throughout the unit. And, you know, I picked it up for $13,000 and I know the building right next door sold for like 60,000 just months before. And so I bought that one. And then the other single family was just an equity play and it's a safer investment. I'm not making as much money monthly off of it, but it goes up in value faster than the other buildings. And I get a a safer tenant, one that wants to take care of the property probably better. Now let's talk about the, the money. So what's your gross rent? Say how much are you bringing in every month? Altogether currently, um, I'm bringing in about ten thousand dollars a month. Okay, and then gross. you're doing Section Eight. So how much of that is guaranteed? How much are you? Uh, how much is showing up automatically without you having to contact a tenant? Um, between between Section Eight and between the other government, like we have the County of Oswego, and then I have like a woman's shelter. So I've got a multiple guaranteed um, streams. I'm going to say it's about 75 to 80% of my money's guaranteed. Awesome. Okay. So, so 75, 80% of it guaranteed showing up on the first like clockwork. And then you've got 10,000 a month in, uh, in, in total rent. How much are your mortgage payments? Altogether, my mortgage payments between all the properties are about $4,000. Okay. Month. And does that include taxes and insurance? That includes taxes and insurance, and also I do have a couple of paid-off properties in there, but okay. they're smaller properties. They don't, they're not valued as high. Okay. All right. So then, so that that leaves you six thousand a month after you pay the mortgages. So how has it been working out as far as like how much of that six thousand that that you have left over after you pay the mortgages? How much of that is going into maintenance for the property? And how much of that is, is your profit? 
I put 15% of gross right off the top. So out of 10,000, I put about $1,500 a month away for maintenance. And then if I wanted to extract, I would extract $4,500 a month safely. And um, the business would self-support itself with the leftover money. Okay. Okay. And so has, has that been, has, has that really kind of worked out that you're making about, or you're putting about 4,500 a month in your pocket? Well, since COVID's hit uh, the last few months, uh, it has been because I'm forced to. But as I said before previously, um, I what I did is I created a business plan for myself and my maintenance guy. And we're trying to just go through because we got a lot of, you know, a couple places. One lady, I should be getting $795. She's paying $583 plus. There were some other issues um, after some inspections went through. And so we would like to still go through um, and get a few more of these apartments turned over. Uh, and that would also increase our profits about $700 a month onto this additional money that, or onto the money that we talked about earlier. So yes, currently, yeah, I am currently earning that over the last few months, but that's only because I, I am not able to go in and, and revamp apartments mm-hmm. that I want to. Okay. Now, what about emergency fund? Like having money set aside, I, I think is really important because you never know when a big expense is going to come. How much money are, are you targeting to have in an emergency fund? I target at least six months of, of rents. So simple math is six months times the 4,000 is 24. So I keep 25,000 and I am closing on another property today. So I'm going to probably bump that up to about $30,000. And really quickly, I would just like to point out the importance of it. Here's the importance of it. Now, in a three-month stretch earlier this year, I had two furnaces go out in January. And I, I'm fortunate to have a, a friend that's a, an HVAC guy. And his company went in there and he just rebuilt them. But that was two grand. A couple weeks later, um, the electricity went out in one of my buildings and I had Nymo came out and sh- which is our, our uh, electric company here, shut the apartment down and that cost me $4,000. And then within a couple weeks later, I got a call from code enforcement saying, Hey, the porches are a little funny on that building. Can you please replace those? That cost me another thousand. So you're looking at about 7,000, 7,500 right around there in a matter of a month mm-hmm. uh, or even two months. If you want to, you want to stretch it out. So if you don't have those reserves and you're in, you're new to this, uh, you're gonna you're gonna find yourself into some trouble, especially if you're investing into a, a C class neighborhood like I am. Right. So it's super important to have those reserves. I 100 percent agree with you because stuff always, for whatever reason, always seems to play out that way that that you get hit with a bunch of stuff all at once. So yeah, having that 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 emergency fund, I, I think, is gonna save you. So. So you're, you're going to continue to grow that. So as you buy more properties, you'll bump up that 30 grand. Yeah. Okay. And I keep that in in a completely separate account. It's not even tied to my business account. I can transfer from the business to that account. Okay. And uh, and that's kind of how I, how I've been doing that. And and I want to say one more thing about writing those checks. Like when I wrote that $4,000 check to have that electrical thing done. It doesn't, it, you don't, you don't like writing the check, but in a way it feels good to write the check because you know, you have it. And it's like, it, it's, it, you know, it's not a worry for you. Mm-hmm. So it's just such peace of mind and, and right. it's huge. Now, the other thing too, that a lot of people don't forget, or a lot of people don't think about when you're looking at rentals is yeah, you're making cash flow and, and that that's great. I mean, you, your properties are are doing great, but your net worth is also growing. Do you look at that too? Yeah. Um, I was looking at that right from the beginning. Um, I'm a big re- reader. I'm an avid reader. And I kind of had lost track of that over the last year. And what I did is I was rereading the uh, millionaire real estate investor. And I remember him saying in there how important it is to keep track of that. So I fired up my computer and I went through and it took me a couple hours to kind of get it all set back up. But I keep copies of all my old stuff on my computer. So I went back and looked and I was so surprised that one year later, my net worth had gone up $65,000 with no significant life changes, meaning that my accounts weren't that much bigger or that much more money in my accounts and my, you know, um, I don't keep a lot of debt, but my debt was similar. It wasn't, you know, $65,000 lower. 
So what I found out is that um, now that I've been keeping track of it for a few months, the first month I was up about 7,500 in net worth. This month I'm up $8,000 in net net worth. Next month I'm looking around the same area between seven and $8,000 in net worth. And I started going, oh my gosh, how is this happening? And as an auditor, and, di- and I love dissecting numbers, I started dissecting everything about why is my net worth going up so fast? And here's what I found out, Dan, is I, I will admit to everybody out there that I do have a pretty handsome nine to five income, but it's from the rentals. Um, so I don't need any of that money. So when money's going into my account and I'm not having to use that money to live on or to increase my lifestyle. That's a big help. But the biggest place I found where I was making money was on the um, equity pay down of my loans and the increase in value of my properties. And I did the numbers and my and they break down like this. My equity pay down per year is about $33,000 a year, which means every time I make a mortgage payment, portion of that goes towards principal, a portion goes towards interest and taxes and insurance. Well, that principal amount gets paid down at the tune of $33,000 a year. I call it my private piggy bank. And on top of that, even if I was modest and said, my properties are going up at 2% in value per year, I own about $800,000 worth of property. That's another 16,000. If you look at that, that's $49,000 a year, Dan. And that's more than the average household or right around the average household income that gets put into a private piggy bank that when I want to, maybe in a couple of years, when there's $150,000 or $200,000 built up more in there, I can access that cash to buy bigger and more properties, to create more cash flow, to create a bigger piggy bank. And the snowball effect just explodes. Yeah, it's really powerful. And, you know, you think you're seeing a pretty big number off eight buildings, you know, imagine in two years, if we talk and you're at 16 buildings, you know, it's like those numbers just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. It's it, it, that to me is, I don't know. It's like, it's almost like I'm looking at it now, Dan, that's more fun than getting the cat collecting the cash. Flow. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, really because exciting. I know at, at the end of the day, we all know if you're a real estate investor and you've been doing it for some time, wealth isn't built overnight. And you know, it's a long game and man, all my loans are 15 years. And so I've got some that are less now they're, you know, they're like 13 years left in 15 years at 2% increase. I'm going to be a millionaire without even doing anything. Right. Right. My, 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 uh, tenants, or I call them subscribers, my monthly subscribers to my units will be paying down these mortgages. And in 15 years, they're going to all be paid off and all worth over a million dollars. Right. So what Luckily made you go, what made you go with the fifteen year? Like this is always something that that I debate because uh, I like the thirty year payment because it's lower and I feel like I have more buffer there. Where the fifteen year payment, you, you get that payoff where your 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 properties are getting paid off that much quicker, but you've got a bigger payment. So w- was that a um? Was that a consideration for you that maybe it would be safer having a 30 year or did you really want to focus on getting these properties paid off? Um, I guess a little bit of both. So mathematically, and again, you know, for everybody out there, when you, when you're, when you're doing this and you put it into the calculator and you're, let, let's say the single family I'm going to buy, you know, I'm closing on tonight. Uh, my total profit is around $700 a month. That's cash flow. And that is also um, equity pay down. If I do a 30 year on that, guess what? I still make the same money no matter what. It's where I want that money to go. Either it's going to go in my piggy, more of it's going to go in my piggy bank with a 15 year loan and less in my pocket, or more is going to go in my pocket and less in my piggy bank. And you can argue, put more in your pocket, you can invest it quicker. Um, But with the price points of my properties being, you know, under a hundred grand on average here, and with the fact that the cash flow is so high, uh, example, I get seven ninety five for two two bedrooms. If I got a duplex with that, that's fifteen ninety a month in gross rents, and my mortgage payments are a little over five hundred dollars with taxes and insurance included. There's a huge spread there, even on a fifteen year note. That's a that's about a thousand dollars knockoff. You know, another hundred sixty for for maintenance and that, and, and I'm still cruising there at seven forty seven fifty a month. Yeah. So the extra extra hundred dollars a month to go or 150 to go 30 years, 
I'll just put that away in my put it away in my uh, private piggy bank there in my for my rainy day fund. Yeah, that, I think that's a good way to think about it because you know it's like the difference between a fifteen year and a thirty year. It's not huge, especially at the price points you're talking about. And to save fifteen years is, um, yeah. I, I think that's really gonna really gonna set you up. Do you ever make extra payments to get them paid off even quicker? Nope. I, okay. I don't, I did, uh, I did for, you know, a, a couple of times, like in the beginning with my triplex and I was like, Oh, I'll get this paid off in like 14 years or I'll get it paid off faster or something like that. But you know what? It, it's not, it's, it's not worth it because when it goes into my checking account, it's earning interest. And plus the interest rates right now are so low. It's just, you, you're almost, you almost shoot yourself in the foot by doing that. Mm-hmm. If you think about it. Yep. You know, if you, if I got 3% interest on, on a lot of these properties, 3.25 and one of them's 2.875% interest, it, like that's like free money if you yep, want to adjust is. for inflation. So basically the, the, the bank gave me free money because if I had put it in my savings account, I was going to lose about two to 3%. Right. So right. it works backwards. So basically they give me free money and I, I'll take it all day long. I know you said you're, you're a big systems guy. Have you created a lot of systems around the management to, to make that easier? Every new tenant that I have that moves in, they have to use the cozy system to pay their rent and put in um, any type of repair or maintenance. So that way it goes to me. And then I do kind of have a, an employee. He, he's very part time, but he'll get an email also on the property in which which unit it is. And then he goes in, he does the repair. He checks off on the list that it's complete. And then the tenant's job is to go in there and say, hey, and they check off. Yes, uh, the job's been complete. And that helps me keep track and make sure that, you know, I don't have too many maintenance requests open and that I don't have, you know, tenants getting upset with me. Because I'm telling you right now, Dan, your relationship with those tenants is the is key. That's true. That's true. So the tenants, when, when they have a service problem, they're not calling you. They're going on to Cozy. They're filling out a request. And then that request is going to your maintenance person? Yes, it goes to me and the maintenance person. A lot of times to me first, and then I'll shove it off to him because I don't know how often he's checking his emails, but I'll, I'll at least give him a text message. But he gets an email also. Now, how is that working? Because, I mean, you've got eight properties. Like it, It's not like you, you have a full-time maintenance person that's working for you. This guy is doing other jobs for other people. Is it hard to get him scheduled or get, is it a a challenge to get him scheduled to get out to one of your properties when you need him? So far, I haven't had any issues. Um, Most of the requests that you get for maintenance um, are are minor things. So uh, just for newbies that are maybe listening out there, when you keep hearing the horror stories of huge, uh, all these maintenance requests and big things happening and leaky toilets at 3 a.m., I'm going to tell you, Dan, I've been doing it for over two years now and I don't get those phone calls. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, I think it's a perfect system. Um, they put them in there and I just tell him, you know, when he's in the area, can he get a hold of that? And it's all, he always surprises me. I expect it done maybe in a couple of days, sometimes like within an hour or two, he'll tell me, Hey, it's all set. That's great. Um, I love it. So he, he's excited too, because I include him in on everything. I tell him when I, when I speak to him again, everything's relationships. I say, we have to do this. Oh, our building over here. I make him feel like he's part of my team. And he's come to me now and he's saying, hey, you know, I'm going to keep working with you. And I'm hoping that you continue to grow. And I'd like to be the full-time guy for you eventually. That's great. Sometime That's great. down the road. Now, what about as far as advertising when you have a vacancy screening? You know, being a systems guy, I'm, I'm sure you've got systems for this too. How are you when you have a vacancy, kind of walk me through what you're doing. So when I have a vacancy, um, I'll go right from the beginning. What I'll do is I'll go in with my maintenance guy and, you know, we have our, our list of what we have to do. I go through just to make sure there's nothing extra special that has to be done, like maybe a new refrigerator or replace the stove or there's something out of line that, you know, um, has to be done. Once we do that, he has his list. He, um, we have, he has a painter that works with him. The painters will come in after all the everything's taken off the walls and they just go in and they and they get the apartment ready. They no carpet. We rip up the floor. It's always uh, scratch resistant, waterproof floors. Um, if the countertop have to be replaced, you know, it, we just go through and we get this apartment in order 
So that way, the next time we go and have to do this, it's like several hundred as opposed to the four thousand dollars that I'm sticking right. into the unit. Then after that, I get I uh, get great pictures. I try to get nice and clean pictures, uh, and I only use Facebook Marketplace. And in my ad, there's bullet points going all the way down. There's probably I don't know 10, 12, 15 bullet points of things that that the um, tenant must have, like. You must have a certain amount of income, to, you know, from the rent uh, compared to the rent. You must have you must be able to have a checking account to use the cozy system and those types of things. And I'm and I'm very, 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 very. Um, uh, I make sure that they have to hit all those points, because if they don't, then there there's somewhere along the line, there's going to be a fail. Mm-hmm. So they'll email me and then I'll email them back and tell them to please reread the ad. And make sure that they meet all the requirements that I have in that ad. And if they do, then I'd be happy to set up an appointment. Then I set up the appointment. It's always one time on my time or on my my maintenance guy's time. And it'll let's say it's a Saturday at, at noon. And so then I uh, we schedule that appointment with usually I get about 50 responses. Out of the 50, 20 will come back after reading the ad. And I might get 10 people there. And out of the 10, I'll get three or four really good, solid leads for somebody that I want to have in there. And then we go by basically him and I'll talk about it. My maintenance guy saying, Hey, that person seemed great. Or, you know, this one kind of, I don't know. And and that's kind of how we, how we choose. We try to choose the best one out of the ones that kind of made it to the final phase. Brian, congratulations. It's really amazing what you've accomplished in just two years. If anybody wants to connect with Brian, I've got all his information, his social media, email, website, YouTube, you name it. It's all on the website. Just go to rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 294. If Brian inspired you and you're ready to buy your first rental or you want to add to your portfolio, the lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge. She's a nationwide lender and she specializes in helping investors buy rental properties. She has a ton of different loan programs, and she can find something customized to you for your situation. If you want to find out more or you want to set up a time to talk to Chaley personally, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E, LendingGroup.com. If you mention Rental Income Podcast, she will waive all the pre-qualification fees. NMLS 42056. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast today. Make sure you subscribe. We have new interviews every single Tuesday. And if you subscribe, you'll get notified as soon as they come out. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.